on behalf of the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, along with the Royal Canadian Institute for Science, I want to welcome you to this year's foundation lecture featuring the current John C. Polanyi Award winner, Dr. Chris Elias Smith. So on behalf of Ryerson, thank you to NSERC and RCIS for choosing Ryerson again as the host for this prestigious event. This is now Ryerson's fifth consecutive year hosting the Foundation Lecture, and we're honored to be part of it. Um, and I'd also like to thank, of course, the Lee Kai-Shang Knowledge Institute at St. Mike's Hospital, our partner in IBES, the Institute for Biomedical Engineering Science and Technology, and the U new uh, biomedical zone located here in the, the building. It's an innovative partnership between Ryerson and St. Mike's to advance uh, scientific, scientific and clinical uh, work. I also want to congratulate Dr. Chris Elias Smith on his prestigious award. Very much looking forward to his presentation and learning more about disruptive technology and artificial intelligence, which I definitely need more of. <laughs> In addition to honoring each year's award winner, the Foundation Lecture is an opportunity to share advances in science and to foster potential collaborations and partnerships across institutions and disciplines. I hope you'll join us after the lecture for re refreshments and networking, and I'm sure Dr. Elias Smith will give us much to ponder and debate this evening. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Helen uh, to scene, the 113th president of the Royal Canadian Institute. Thank you very much, Wendy. So, as uh, Wendy has said, I'm the 113th president. Doesn't mean that we switch presidents every couple of weeks. The organization is 165 years old, and our mission is very simple. It's to bring science to the public through venues like this. So we provide a platform for scientists to engage with Canadians across Canada. We do that through public lectures, events, pub nights, through webcasts, and so on. So you can go online later, and you can actually see Chris's talk where there's many programs out there that introduce science to children and youth, we're unique in that we reach out to the public. We believe that a higher level of understanding by science, about science by Canadians makes us a better Canada. So I'm very proud to be the president of such a scientifically important organization. We were established in 1851. If you saw some of the graphics going through, you can see there's a big royal charter given to us by Queen Victoria in 1851. So we're the oldest scientific society in Canada. We believe in the power of partnerships, and together we can accomplish more than alone. Therefore, over the past many years, we've been partnering with Ryerson and other key organizations across Canada who share the vision of bringing science to the public. So we're very pleased to be here today to partner with Ryerson University and with NSERC to bring our foundation lecture in honor of the 2015 Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council John C. Polanyi Award. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Pierre Charest, NSERC's Vice President of Research Grants and Scholarships, who will introduce our speaker. Dr. Charest joined NSERC in August 2011. He previously held the position of Associate Vice President of Corporate Planning and Policy at NSERC. Prior to that, he worked at Health Canada, where he was Director General of Science Policy Directorate. He's also held positions of Associate Vice President of the Science Branch of the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and Director General of Health Canada's Bio Bio Biologics and Genetic Therapies Directorate and Office of Biotechnology and Science. He started his career in public service in 1989 as a research scientist at the Canadian Forest Service of Natural Resources Canada. Prior to his current position, he also served as chair and member of several peer review committees for NSERC, for the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, the Canada Foundation for Innovation, and Genome Canada. So welcome, Pierre.
Well, thank you for uh, those kind words. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, bonsoir. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight at the Royal Canadian Institute for the Advancement of Sciences Foundation Lecture. First of all, I, I would like to thank the Royal Canadian Institute for their continual collaboration with NSERC. And this lecture is a wonderful way to communicate the work of Canada's top researchers. Tonight, I have the, the, the opportunity to introduce you all to the 2015 winner of the John C. Polanyi Award, Dr. Chris Ilya Smith. This award recognizes an individual whose research has led to an outstanding recent advance in the natural sciences and engineering. Dr. Ilya Smith is a prime example of the excellence that NSERC supports and promotes. Chris' research is helping us to understand, as he's put it before, our most intimate home, the brain. Chris and his team have developed a model of the brain that is the largest functioning model of its kind in the world. It's called SPAWN. Hopefully I've got the right pronunciation. It promises to revolutionize how we understand the brain and how we treat brain disorders. It's an incredible feat for Chris and his team. Mesdames et messieurs, j'ai grand plaisir de vous présenter le conférencier de ce soir. So please join me in welcoming our speaker this evening, Dr. Chris Elias Smith. Thank you very much. I feel like I should actually introduce somebody, since everybody else got to introduce somebody, but no such luck. Um, so if we can switch to my slides. Uh, I'm going to start by thanking everybody who made this possible. Thanks uh, very much for the invitation from RCI. Thanks to Ryerson for providing this uh, facility. Um, and thanks, of course, to NSERC for the prize and support throughout my research career. And I'd also like to uh, offer my special thanks to um, Professor Paul Anyi for coming himself. It sort of puts the pressure on to some extent. So I'm a little bit <laughs> extra nervous here, but I really appreciate we had a wonderful conversation over dinner. Uh, so yes, it's, it's been uh, fantastic to have all this support. And of course, you know, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for everybody showing up and coming to listen to a little bit of science, right? So thank you all very much for being interested enough to show up. It's uh, you know, always exciting to talk about basically the, my favorite thing to talk about other than my kids, perhaps. But, and that is the brain, right? The brain. This is what Woody Allen once referred to as man's second favorite organ. <laughs> and in fact, recently it's become the favorite organ of a lot of very large governments around the world. And for this reason, there's been huge amounts of money being poured into brain science. And so I'm just going to take a little quick tour around the world here to give you some sense of what different countries are doing. And you know, the brain is such a multifaceted and complex thing that everybody can do something different. So in the European Union, they announced a 1 billion euro fund, uh, which has um, been focused on building a very large scale model of the brain. So trying to build software, uh, using developing computers, which don't exist right now, called exascale computers. So this is sort of you know, thousands of times more memory and storage and uh, computational power than what's currently available, because we need those kinds of resources in order to simulate something as complex as the brain. There are uh, countries like Japan who have decided that instead of going the route of trying to build a model, they're going to try to understand one particular creature in a lot of detail, and they picked a marmoset. And they picked the marmoset because it is closely related to humans. Uh, it's sort of good in captivity. It's easy to do lots of different sorts of experiments on marmosets, and they have a history of being able to collect a lot of data about the marmoset, both the anatomy, so what the structure of the brain is like, and physiology, what happens while the marmoset is doing various kinds of tasks, like vision or audition or what have you. Uh, in China, they've taken a more technological kind of approach. So they've been uh, developing a lot of hardware um, that is taking the sort of massive amounts of expertise that they have in building uh, computer chips and seeing if they can build computer chips that work more like the brain in order to run algorithms which are more like the brain, because uh, you know, the brain is still much better at certain things than standard computers are. If you look to the United States, right after the European Union sort of announced their big project, not to be outdone, the Americans uh, about two months later announced a $1 billion investment into brain sciences. This has become known as the Obama Brain Initiative. They have uh, focused mostly on just getting more and better quality data than what anybody else can. So they have uh, 
a lead in lots of areas and being able to record minute details about what's going on in the brain. Uh, and they're trying to turn this more towards a functional map, they call it, which means looking at what happens at a very small level while the animal's actually doing something. So we have a lot of anatomical data, a lot of genetic data um, that you can sort of extract from the brain when the animal's not doing anything, i.e. dead. But you also want to have an understanding of what's going on during activity. And so uh, they've launched this initiative, which is uh, over a 10-year period, to try to get that information at a level of detail which is just not yet available. And of course, Canada, we've also announced a $100 million fund for, uh, it's called, the, uh, what is it called? Brain Canada. Uh, and they have decided to focus mostly on diseases, so trying to understand the sorts of things that go wrong um, and target certain kinds of clinical applications in order to sort of improve the future of brain health. Right, so we saw all of these different things going on around the world. And uh, I've been lucky enough to actually sit in on uh, meetings and conferences at all of these different initiatives, except for the one in Japan, actually. Uh, and it's quite clear that you know, when you're sitting in these rooms, there's industry leaders, there's politicians, there's uh, scientists. Everyone has come to the realization, um, for reasons which when, don't take long to figure out when you stop and think about it, that if we deepen our understanding of the brain, we are going to improve uh, society in all kinds of ways. And we can just stop and think about what those sorts of ways are. Right? So in Canada alone, we spend about $51 billion a year dealing with mental health issues. If we could come to understand how the brain works better, we could presumably test drugs right, or other kinds of brain interventions while harming far fewer humans or other animals. We could maybe come to understand uh, kinds of algorithms for building machines which are more helpful to us. Right? They could become partners in researching deep and difficult questions. And maybe in some ways what's behind all of these projects is just the realization that if we understand the brain better, we're really going to understand ourselves better. Because it's quite clear that all of the sorts of complexities we see in human behavior in some sense have a root in the brain, both the good and the bad. So we'd like to understand this because it's quite clear that the implications are enormous, right? There's huge industrial implications, social implications, scientific implications. But how are we going to come to understand something as complicated as the brain? So the human brain has about 80 billion neurons in it. Billion with a B. That's about as many stars as you can see. A huge number of individual cells. These cells are connected such that, on average, a neuron has 10,000 inputs and 10,000 outputs. There are about 72 kilometers of fiber connecting all of those cells together. This is probably the most complicated device that we've ever tried to understand. So how are we going to come to understand something this complicated? So you can, if you look at those uh, examples that I threw up there of brain projects, you can get some idea. right? So one thing we're going to do is collect a lot of data. And by a lot of data, I mean more data than we've ever collected before about anything else. So radio telescopes generate huge amounts of data. But recording from a single mouse brain while performing a task is expected to uh, make us need to record about three times more data than what we're collecting per second from all of the radio telescopes. So we're going to have huge amounts of data. Another thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to organize that data. Right? Just recording information isn't sufficient to do science. You really need to organize it. And what that means is that we're going to need theories. So this is something that's familiar from physics. Right? The way that we've made some huge leaps in physics is by coming up with fairly simple theories, simple in the sense that they're short to write down, that explain huge amounts of data. And ideally, we would like to do exactly that same kind of thing in neuroscience. But there are some important differences between physics and neuroscience. In neuroscience, you are essentially dealing with a nonlinear system to start. So in physics, there are lots of instances where we could sort of simplify things to get to a point where we could write down equations and do very sophisticated analyses on them. But when you turn to biology, often that's just not possible because of the complexity of the system. So instead of doing the same sorts of analyses, what we often do is we build simulations. So instead of expressing our understanding merely through equations, that is just by writing equations down and analyzing them, we write down equations, but we need to simulate them to see what's really going to happen. Right? So essentially, we're trying to understand how the brain works by building one. But in this case, we're building a software simulation of one. So let's, let me sort of try to step you through what it is that we're trying to simulate. 
So this is a single neuron, right? So we tend to start with a single cell. And many of you probably have some idea how neurons work, but I'm just going to sort of run through this quickly. So on the left-hand side, we've got inputs to the cell. So those processes are called dendrites. The big blob in the middle is the cell body. And then the long extension going over to the right, this is an axon. That's kind of the output of the cell. And then it branches into many parts, which are going to connect to the dendrites of subsequent cells, so information can keep on flowing. So if we go back to the left-hand side here, what happens is a lot of information is coming in from presynaptic neurons, so neurons that are connected to this one. If there's enough input that it, such that it goes over a threshold, then we see a very brief action potential get emitted, and you can see these yellow circles that go flying down the axon every once in a while. So that's sort of like the cell making a decision that it has gotten enough information to this point where it's willing to send a signal to the neurons that it's connected to. It wants to pass that message on. And when it gets to the far right-hand end, that same electrical spike goes to all of the neurons that it's connected to. Now, before it actually gets to those subsequent neurons, it turns into chemicals. So it actually goes from electrical to chemical. The, chemi chemi uh, the uh, chemicals go across a very brief uh, or small space and then induce another electrical change in the receiving cells. And when that happens, when it goes across that, what's called a synaptic cleft, so this little space, the um, action potential, that spike, can either have a big influence or a small influence or a median influence on the cell that receives it. And so we call that a weight. Right? So we get the same spike going to all of those connections at the end, but then they have different weights depending on who's listening. So cell number one might have a small weight, cell number two might have a big weight, and so on. And surprisingly, in order to expl explore uh, neural computation, the thing that you really need to pay the most attention to are those weights. If you can figure out how to set those weights in the right way, then you can build systems that do, thing like, do things like recognize images, or control arms, or store a memory. Right? That really seems to be the place where computation is essentially happening in the brain. So being able to set those weights is basically how we do information processing. All right, so we begin with a single cell. And essentially, we can write down a few equations to express that process that I just described for you, one of gathering information in the dendrites, making a decision about whether that we've got enough information, and then sending a spike out down the axon. So most models in theoretical neuroscience, that is, in people who are you know, built by people who are interested in understanding the brain, really begin with a single, single cell. And then they'll typically put many, many cells together. Right? So the, the uh, European project that I spoke about, they have built a very large model which they uh, call the blue brain. It's kind of the centerpiece of the human brain project. And this is a small slice from a big model that they built. And in that model, they have about 30,000 neurons. And they have about 37 million connections between all of those neurons. And you can see each of the neurons is really quite complicated. It's patterned after specific recordings that have been found in rodent brains. So to describe the functioning of one of these cells, they use hundreds of equations, because they're very complicated machines. There's all kinds of ion channels and so on. And once you have something this complicated, you can connect it all together. And then you can run a simulation. And what is being shown in this simulation is the flow of voltage or change of voltage across all of these neurons. So if you see any neurons that are blue, those neurons are basically doing nothing. If you see a lot of red, that's very high voltage. Yellow is sort of in the middle and so on. And the, the white ones are the most active. They have the most voltage when this sort of snapshot was taken. So it actually takes a large supercomputer's days to run a simulation of this very small volume of a rodent cortex. So this is one example of how people build models. Another example is from the Synapse Project. This is something that has been rolled into the Obama Brain Initiative from the United States. So they spent about $100 million on this project. And a couple of years ago, they had this exact slide up in their PowerPoint presentation. And they said, you know, we built this really big brain model. In this particular simulation, they had a billion neurons that were being simulated. And so cats have about a billion neurons in them. So they said, we have a cat scale simulation. <laughs> Since then, they've actually simulated uh, 500 billion neurons. Right? So this is five times more than in the human brain. And again, you know, they take supercomputers uh, quite a long period of time to run these extensive simulations. But they're able to say, you know, we've now simulated something on the scale, in fact, past the scale of a human brain. Now, there's some important differences between these models that I've shown you. So as I mentioned, the one with about 30,000 neurons had hundreds of equations per cell. This one only has about two equations per cell. 
Right? So very different ways of using computational resources. In both cases, you need a whole lot of them. And so, of course, as you can imagine, scientists being who they are, there's all kinds of competition about whose model is the best. And so this project, the Synapse project, is uh, headed by Dharmendra Moda. And he said that his project was a tremendous historic milestone. <laughs> the other project I mentioned before from the European Union is headed by a guy by the name of Henry Markram. And he disagreed. <laughs> In fact, he went on to say that it's highly unethical of Moda to mislead the public in making people believe they have actually simulated a cat's brain. Absolutely shocking. And in fact, he went on for pages and pages about how he should be strung up by his toes and all kinds of things. And then he sent it to all kinds of journalists. And so you can find it still on the web. It's a very interesting example of social connections in science. But I actually think that both of these projects are sort of limited in what they're trying to do. Right? So what they've done is they've built models of individual neurons, and they've connected many of them together, sometimes billions of them together. But in my estimation, they've missed probably the most important thing about a brain. Right? Why do we all have a brain? It, we do not have brains to make complicated uh, voltage patterns, right? or to say that we can run uh, 80 billion of them at once. We have a brain to control behavior. Right? And you'll notice that I didn't say anything about behavior. I mentioned cats, but that's just because they also have a billion neurons. So there's nothing about behavior in any of these models which means that they've connected all the neurons together, which I mentioned was very important, but they connected them essentially randomly. And so when you connect them randomly, it's not clear what, you're, what information you're gathering about how real brains actually work, because real brains are not randomly connected. They're connected in such a way that they realize behavior, right? They let us remember things. They let us see things. They let us stand up in front of audiences and give talks and all kinds of stuff. So this has really been the focus of the work in my group, right? Is try to say, can we write down mathematical theories that let us express ways of connecting neurons together to realize particular kinds of functions, right? To try to make neurons, which we will model in the same sorts of ways that we saw these other uh, neurons being modeled, to make those neurons actually do information processing. And one thing's pretty clear, right? If we, if we actually do this correctly, so if we connect these neurons in the right kind of way, we can get interesting things to happen. So like everybody, we start with one neuron, and then we put thousands or millions or lots and lots, this is two and a half million neurons together, to try to see, can we get them to actually do something interesting? And this is an example of that model that was mentioned before called SPAWN, which stands for Semantic Pointer Architecture Unified Network. It's not just SPAWN, which sounds kind of menacing. And when we do this, we can see that we can build things that, in this case, is performing a fairly simple task. Right? It's a simple task, but it is going all the way from input to output. So it's got an eye. We're showing it an image, just like we would show to you. And we're basically asking it to classify that number. And so it uses its hand to write out what it thinks it saw. Right? So it's going all the way through, and it's actually determining what the tensions in the muscles on the arm are so it can move that arm. So the arm has weight and length and is a nonlinear system, just like your arm. But of course, because this is a model, right, we cannot just look only at the behavior. It's important for us to get the behavior, but we can actually look inside. Right? So for instance, we can look at all of the neurons and how, what their spiking activity is like in the visual cortex. That's what I'm showing at the back of the brain. Now, in order to solve this task, you can't just see a number. Right? You actually have to remember the number at least long enough to write it down. So we can look at the frontal cortices, where we see memories being stored. So here you can store C an 8 is sitting there for a period of time before it is written out and goes away. And lastly, we can look at what the activity in the motor cortex is. And what I'm showing in that bubble is basically the set of points that the motor cortex is trying to make the arm go through in order to express its answer. So this is nice, because when you have a model now, you've got all the data. right? There's nothing that's being hidden from you in the case of a model. Well, that wasn't supposed to happen. Uh, so there's nothing that's being hidden from you. And what this means is that you can go and begin to do analyses on the model of any kind that you've seen people do in experiments. And so this is showing an example of what happens if we look at the neurons in the visual cortex of the model, and we perform exactly the same analysis on the neural activity there that was performed on the uh, data coming from a monkey. So here you can see on the bottom row, you've got data coming from a, a monkey performing a visual task where it's basically just being shown natural uh, images. And then we took our model, and we showed it natural images. And then we collected 
spikes. So you can actually record those, that neural activity in the form of very brief action potentials in the monkey. We can do the same thing in our model. We process them in exactly the same sorts of ways, and then we see a lot of similarities in the kind of responses that individual neurons have. So these are showing basically features and images that those neurons like. And you see you get you know, some that are sort of slanted in a particular way, some that go white, black, white, some that are like circular blobs, and some that are more elongated. And these are all the kinds of features that seem important for explaining how vision happens in monkeys. So it was nice that we had this sort of simple perceptual task, but it, it is a simple task. We really wanted to go for cognition, right? We wanted to understand how can you put neurons together to do something cognitive. And so I'm going to show you an example of a cognitive task that you can perform. So you can see if you can solve this, this is a puzzle. And what your job is is to figure out what goes in where that question mark is at the end. So when you're doing this, this is actually sort of trivial for people sometimes. Right? It's very easy for you to look at that and see a particular pattern and figure out how to complete that pattern. But in fact, only people are very good at performing this kind of task. Right? Because what you've really done is you've noticed that there is one thing, and then two things, and then three things. And the thing part doesn't matter. Right? It's an abstraction. It's a variable. In the first row, it's ones. In the second row, it's fours. And in the last row, it's fives. And your ability to make that kind of generalization, just looking at the structure, it's called a syntactic structure, and so it's called syntactic generalization, your ability to do that is something that is uniquely human. Or at least humans are far, far better at it than other animals. So we can watch Spawn doing the same sort of thing. Now Spawn can't look around. Its eye is basically fixed in one place, so we're showing it digits right in front of it. And I should comment that it's never seen this particular pattern of digits before, so it's trying to figure out, based on what it's being shown, how it's going to answer at the end once it's shown the question mark. And presumably, just like you got, it's going to figure out that the next thing that comes is three fives. And the nice thing is that we could actually then ask it, well, what would come after that? Right? So if you had to go after three fives, you wanted to go the next in the row, what would you say? Four fives. Right? So you're sort of figuring out that it's just, yeah, add one. That's what happened across the rows, and that's how it extended. And we can see that Spawn makes those same sorts of inferences. So it will generalize in the same sorts of way that people do. Right, so it's looking at those, for those structural patterns in the input, and it's finding them. And this is really interesting, because if you actually do this across lots of, of these sorts of tests, this sort of cognitive test, we can show that it scores about the same as people. In fact, this particular kind of problem is one that's used on uh, fluid intelligence tests. It's called the Raven's Progressive Matrices. And so Spawn scores about the same as uh, college-age students. So it's nice that Spawn is able to perform these tasks, but hopefully it's clear that I'm not just interested in that it can perform these tasks, but in how it performs these tasks. Right? We want it to perform them in a human-like way, and if that's the case, then we should expect human-like mistakes as well. And so we wanted to test the model to see if it failed in the same ways that people fail. So here's an example of remembering a list of digits, just like you might remember a telephone number. So we're going to give it a bunch of digits, and it has to repeat them back to us. And you'll notice that in the middle of that list, it's sort of beginning to forget some of the information. And so it's beginning to write its answers down. And when it comes to that 8, it's going to draw a horizontal line, which means it's not sure what's there. But then it will continue to complete the list. Right? And so just like you, Spawn can remember the beginning and the ends of lists better than the middle. And in fact, you can show it lists of any length that you want. And we can see statistically how similar it is to humans. And if we do that, then this is a, an example just showing 4, 5, and 6 uh, item lists. But the, inf the data on the right, which is from humans, and the model performance on the left are statistically indistinguishable. So you can see, obviously, slight differences. But those differences, as far as we know, are just statistical differences. So this means now that it looks like Spawn is able to not only perform tasks, which humans are able to perform, but it actually is making the same kinds of errors, right? So it's using the same kinds of resources, and it seems to have some of the same kinds of cognitive limitations. And last, I want to show an example where Spawn sort of goes into the um, task not really knowing what to do. So this is going to be a sort of gambling task. So you'll notice that the very first thing that Spawn is going to do is it's going to guess a number. So it's going to be shown a question mark, says, what do you want to do? And then it has to guess. And this uh, task is patterned after something called bandit tasks, after the one-armed bandit, so it's sort of like gambling in the casino. 
And what you do, uh, how you get an animal to perform a bandit task, so a rodent, for instance, you put it in a T maze, and it will run up to a choice point, and then it has to either go right or left, and it makes a decision to go right or left, and then you give it reward or you don't with some probability. Right? So right's going to get some probability of reward, left is going to get some probability of reward. And if you leave the rodent in there, after a while it will figure out what the most rewarded direction is, and it's just start going that way for a long time. And of course, being a scientist, you're like, oh, I wonder what happens if I change the reward probabilities. And so then you can see that the rodent will start basically getting disappointed when it's not getting any more reward, and start exploring more, and then eventually it'll figure out where the most reward is, and so on. And so we can see the same thing happening in the model. So the first thing it does is being told which task to do, and it says, guess, what would you like to do? And it drew the number one, and it got a reward. It got a one. And then what would you like to do? It draws a one and gets a zero, meaning no reward. So it guesses one again, zero, no reward. So now it begins to change its guess. Right? So it's now beginning to explore the space to some extent. It begins to guess a two, and in this particular instance, two is the one that is, has the most uh, highest probability of reward. And so as it guesses a two over and over again, it keeps getting reward, and so it keeps guessing a two. But eventually, the scientists, that's us in this instance, change the probability of reward. So now it's much less likely to get reward. It still keeps guessing for a while, and it can occasionally, just by luck, get some reward, because it's a probability. It's not zero or one. But eventually, it gets very little reward, and again, begins to switch strategies and say, oh, okay, I better try something else, right? and so on and so on. And so you can actually begin to gather this information and compare how often does the model choose to go left or right, under which probability changes will it make that switch, when will it not switch, and so on. And so you can compare the behavior fairly precisely to rodents in the same sort of situation. You can also look at the spikes, so the individual neuron action potentials, in the area that's really responsible for this kind of reward behavior. This is in part of the brain called the basal ganglia, in the ventral striatum in particular. And so what I've done here is just plot the activity of all the spikes in the model at the bottom, uh, and then spikes from uh, an experiment that was run in a rodent. And then we can just filter them in the same sort of way, which gives us the black and gray line on top. So that's basically just doing a simple analysis and be able to compare them. And you can see that a lot of the dynamics, so how fast it's firing, when it fires a lot, when it fires less, and, uh, and so on, is fairly well replicated by the model. All right, so this is fairly you know, rewarding to us as scientists to be able to build a model and make matches not only at the level of behavior, but also at the level of sort of fine neural detail, where when individual spikes occur in the brain while performing a particular behavior. But in some ways, perhaps the most important thing for us about this model was that it's actually exactly the same model that's doing all of this stuff. Right? So instead of building one model for one task, another model for another task, we were able to begin to explore how we could have the same model perform lots of tasks. Right? So for instance, you can be driving a car, and then you can stop your car and decide to go check email, because we all know you don't do them at the same time. Right? But you're using the same brain when you do these different things. You could then go and play a game of chess or a game of hockey, and it's the same brain. Your brain is not changing by enormous amounts as you're switching through all these different sorts of tasks. And that kind of flexibility is something that you really don't see in machines these days. Right? So we have some very good chess-playing machines, but they can't then go and answer an email or drive a car. Right? So that particular kind of flexibility is something that we were very interested in. Right? So hopefully you get the idea. Right? The spawn, in some senses, we believe, is working kind of like a brain. And so you know, we were fairly happy with ourselves at this point. Right? We had built a model that seemed to work like a brain. It got lots of different tasks. It got some cognitive tasks and some not-so-cognitive tasks. It also helped us understand when brains can switch between tasks, what kinds of mechanisms uh, can make that happen. Uh, it got us a publication in Science, which was a good thing. Uh, it won us the Paul Annie Award, which was a pretty amazing thing. So all this stuff was you know, making us feel pretty good, and we thought, you know, we're pretty good. But not everybody agreed. right? <laughs> So Henry Markram came back, and he had a different opinion. And I should comment that actually everything I've talked to up to this point was basically what the Paul Annie Prize was recognizing, and everything from this point on is more recent work. So Henry said it wasn't a brain model. So why did he say that? Well, he said that because the neurons that we're using in our model are kind of like the synapse project neurons. So there's a couple of equations per cell. And in Henry Markram's model, he had more equations per cell than we did. And so he said that our model basically didn't have enough detail. There wasn't enough biological detail in our model to count as a brain model. And I think that's not a very good way to evaluate brain models for lots of reasons. But another way to think about it, 
rather than just being sort of sad, <laughs> is to say this is a challenge, right? This is some, somebody telling us, you know, you said that your mathematical theory doesn't care about how many equations you use per cell, which is true, we did say that. So can you actually rise to the challenge and introduce something as complex as my neurons in my model? And so we said, yes, we, could, we should try that, right? So here's a really complicated neuron model. So we borrowed this model. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't get their exact neurons because they didn't release them publicly. So we took something which is very similar, and it turns out it has pretty much exactly the same number of equations per cell as what they do, the same number of uh, sort of compartments and so on. And uh, we took this and we actually borrowed it from a, another group which had made the model and they showed that it had all kinds of really nice fits to the data, a lot of so, sort of sophisticated uh, response curves which you don't get out of the simple model um, where you can see these effects of uh, what the resistance is and the soma, as a so that soma is the cell body as a function of the frequency of the input stimulus, all kinds of neat things. So we could take this really complicated single cell model and then we could go back to our spawn model and we could say, okay, let's take out that part of the brain and replace it with these really complicated neurons. So I want to emphasize that we're not replacing all of the brain with these really complicated neurons because we do not have a computer big enough, not very many people do, that could actually run two and a half million of those cells. Uh, as I mentioned, even the Blue Brain Project, they only run about 30,000 of those cells. So we just took one small part of our model, we left all the rest as sort of simple neurons, but we made that one part really complicated neurons. And so, of course, the first thing we want to do is to make sure that our model still works. So we've got spawn in the background and then spawn plus in the front. That's the one with the complicated neurons. And so here it is performing the same recognition task that you saw it uh, perform before. And you can see that the front and the back kind of look the same, right? So they're doing the same thing. So that's good. So we did not break our model when we introduced these complex neurons. But of course, you don't want to just make your model more complicated for the sake of complexity. Right? There's no point. If you're going to make a model complicated, it should be for a reason. Right? You should be trying to explain something you couldn't explain before. So what did we get with, these, with this addi additional complexity? Essentially what we got was the ability to manipulate some of the mechanisms at the neural level that we didn't have before. So I won't go into the details too much, but each of these neurons has ion channels. There's many different kinds of ion channels. In our simple model, we basically had no ion channels, or maybe one. In the complicated model, we have 10 different ion channels, and they're mapped specifically to ion channels you can measure in real neurons. And so what we could do is we could look for drugs that would influence some of those ion channels and see what would happen if we applied that drug in simulation to our brain model. Right? So now we're able to actually test the effects of drugs on our brain model. The particular drug we chose is called TTX. This is a drug which is uh, uh, derived from, uh, I believe it is sea urchin poison. So it's basically a kind of poison that you find. And the reason you feel bad if you get stabbed by one of those is because they basically make your neurons shut down. Right? And they're affecting a particular ion channel called a sodium ion channel. And so now we can look at how does that model perform, how well does it uh, classify digits, that's all that was doing, as we change the amount of TTX drug that we're injecting. And the amount that you inject um, directly controls how many sodium channels are blocked. Okay, so here we have the number of, the percentage of sodium channels that are blocked. And you can see for a long time, you do okay, right? So it's still doing very good recognition up around 96%. Uh, I didn't mention the model gets about 96% and humans get about 98% on this test. And then as you begin to crank it up, you begin to see degradation. And then here we're now down around chance. So after about 60% of the sodium channels are blocked, basically that part of the brain is really not doing anything very useful. So this was kind of neat because now we had a, a good answer to Henry Markham saying, well, look, if we want, we can use the complicated neurons. And B, we had a real reasons for introducing them because it gave us more insight into the low-level biological mechanisms. But this really was very specific to one part of the brain, which it's really influenced this one particular task, performance on this one task. So we were interested in going back to our brain model and saying, oh, well, let's take out another part of the brain and replace that with complicated neurons and then see what happens. And so this part that we picked, OFC, orbital frontal cortex, seems to be important for keeping track of what you're doing during a task. And the very first task that we did this to was a counting task, where basically a, you give the model a digit to start at, and then you tell it how long to count. So you could say, start at a three, and then count for four, and then it would start at three, and then after a little while, it would write down a seven, because that's how far it had counted. But we noticed in this counting task, as soon as we sort of got the drug concentration high enough, it didn't do anything. So that was really hard to judge whether it had just completely broken or you know, whether something interesting was going on. So with exactly that same part of the brain model affected, we tried a different task. 
in this case, we're trying a, uh, that working memory task, but it has to remember a list of digits. So here we can watch what's happening. So in the back, again, is the regular spawn model. The one in front has these complicated neurons, but we've now introduced some of that drug. And so here it's just getting the list of digits that it has to remember. And you see that it can sort of remember those digits fine. So it's a very short list, only four digits. Um, but you can see as it's responding, it's sort of going kind of slow, and eventually it just forgets what it's doing, and it stops. Right? So it's basically lost track of where it was in the task. And so the nice thing about this set of experiments, this coupled with the counting tasks, is we can look actually at the differential effects of drugs across tasks. And so this, again, gives us a little bit more insight into how the same drug in one place can have lots of different sorts of cognitive effects that might show up in different kinds of ways. All right, so this, you know, in some ways is a very initial demonstration. It's uh, a fairly um, sort of heavy-handed kind of drug to use, one that is well-characterized and so on. Um, but, you know, your imagination can make you think, well, if we have a drug that we know something about the mechanisms, we can begin to look at what sorts of cognitive effects we expect. We might be able to get a sense of the kinds of side effects that would happen. We can try this across lots of different models. When we, every time we build a new model, we kind of get a new individual that's going to uh, behave slightly differently and so on. Right, so this is kind of nice. It gives us one way of trying to understand uh, how biology relates to high-level behavior. But we also want to look at sort of other ways that biology relates to high-level behavior. So I'm going to turn into a, to a slightly different way of understanding this interaction between biology and behavior, or biology and cognition. And I'm going to look at the issue of aging. Right? So uh, I'm going to turn back to that cognitive task that I had. I mentioned that it's, it's used often in a general intelligence test. Um, and in fact, we also built another model, so it's not Spawn. It's uh, sort of came after Spawn. It's a little bit uh, bigger in some senses, but it doesn't have all the parts that Spawn had in it. But we were specifically interested in looking at that Raven's progressive matrices. And so what we did with this model is we actually got it to do the entire uh, intelligence test. So we could do all of the different sorts of tasks. And I'm going to start by just giving you a sense of what the kinds of questions that will show up on these intelligence tests are. So one is a sequence kind of task. So this is sort of three examples, one in each row. Or, or sorry, this is a matrix just like before. And you can see that, like before, it's just increasing by one. Right? So that's kind of the example that we saw before. And so there's a bunch of these sorts of sequence tasks. There's also what we call set tasks. So this one, to figure out what goes in that empty square at the end, you sort of have to notice that each row you can also solve these all by columns, by the way. But each row has one square, one triangle, and one circle. And then they sort of show up in different orders as you go down. Right? So each row has to have all of them. Each row also has to have something shaded from the left, shaded from the top, and shaded from the bottom. Right? And so if you put all of that together, you can figure out that what would go in the last square is a triangle that would be shaded from the left. Okay? So that's kind of a set task. But there's actually sort of two patterns going on at the same time. And then we have this last kind of question, which is a sort of, or sort of pattern that you see in these intelligence tests. This is the operation pattern. Can anyone figure out what would go in that last square there? So something's happening. This one is slightly different than the other two. Yeah? The first two squares in the row are superimposed. Right. So the first two squares are kind of superimposed to give you the third square. OK, so unlike the other ones where it was kind of a sequence, Right, or a set, here you kind of added the two together. Right? And so th at the very end, you'd basically take this, the uh, diamond and the x and the triangle and the dot, and you'd put that all together to fill in the last circle, or the last uh, box, sorry, there. And in fact, on the real tests, they often match a bunch of these different things at the same time. So you might have one square which has both this kind of operation and the set sort of patterns going through it at the same time. So they do get quite challenging. These, these uh, tests. And the other thing I should mention is that I can't actually show you any of the real test contents, right? So if I was showing you intelligence test questions, then that would kind of ruin the intelligence test for you. And so it's illegal to publish any of this sort of thing. So these are just kind of examples that give you a general sense of the sorts of questions that show up. But for the model, we could actually get a copy of the real test and run the model on the real test. OK, so when you. When, after we built the model and we could compare it to the data, we can see that the model is kind of an average performer. Right? So it's in the middle there. It's the one that has the error bars on it. And uh, the stuff on the left-hand side, these are just different sorts of errors that people would tend to make. 
Uh, and so you see that the model also matches the kinds of errors reasonably well. Uh, but the most important thing for us is that you know, it seems to be uh, an average performer, right? which means that it's doing fairly well. And average performer is about as uh, what uh, college age students will do on this test. Now, one of the reasons we were looking at this particular test, as I mentioned before, is we wanted to understand how biology would affect this, and in particular, how uh, aging related to performance on these cognitive tests. And as you can imagine, there's bad news for those of us over 40 anyways, right? As you get older, you get dumber. Or, well, that's not the right way to say it. I guess you do worse at these tests of cognitive performance. OK, so let's look at that data. So here we can see, right, younger people score the highest. And then as you progressively get older, your scores go down. And you can see that the errors are kind of distributed uh, equally across. So we wanted to make our model do that same sort of thing, have that same sort of pattern. And so what we were really interested in doing is testing two hypotheses about you know, why do we do worse on these tests as we get older. Does anybody have any guesses why we would do worse as we get older? What happens to your brain as you get older? I think I heard someone say it. Neurons just die, right? You get older, there's a myth around that sometimes you get bumped in the head, you just lost a bunch of neurons, or you drink a beer and you lost a bunch of neurons. So it's not clear that it's that simple, but it is clear that as you get older, you do have fewer neurons in your cortex. So neurons will just die off. So we can test that model, or test that hypothesis now. Right? This is something which is entirely unethical to test in human subjects. Right? You can't take people, kill off their neurons, and see if they get worse on tests. <laughs> but conveniently, we can do that with our model. Right? So there's another hypothesis around that people who are older might think of, before they think of this neuron dying one, because you know, even me, I'm only 45, but still I notice already that I'm over 40. And, and this means that you sort of, you know, things just aren't as crisp and clear as they once were, right? And there's actually a word for this, it's called de-differentiation. It means that mental representations that you have become more similar as you get older. So they're more difficult for you to tell apart two representations. And we tested that hypothesis as well. So we, can, we know what the rep mental representations are across a group of neurons, and we can make them, those representations more similar or less similar, depending on how we set up the model. And what we found is that actually both neuron di neurons dying and de-differentiation could account for some of the loss that you see in uh, performance. But in fact, to account for as much as you see, as best as we could, you actually needed both sources of uh, sort of decrease in performance. And this is interesting, because there was a long debate, as you can imagine, about people who thought it was all neuron loss and people who thought it was all de-differentiation. And when it comes down to it, it seems like really you need both of those things. This is something that you could not have done without a model. As I mentioned, you can't perform at least one of those experiments without a model. I don't know how you'd confuse people either. So when we put both of those in, we get this sort of pattern that I'm showing. And you'll notice that it does a very good job of replicating the difference between uh, younger performers, middle-aged, and older performers of this test. So this was nice, right? It gave us a way of really pulling apart these factors that it wasn't clear how you'd be able to pull apart. So to this point, I've really talked a lot about the sorts of uh, health applications of this kind of research. Um, but as was mentioned in the introduction, and also something that we're very interested in, is there are other kinds of technological applications as well. So for the remainder of the talk, the next five minutes or so, I'm just going to go over a couple of the sorts of applications that we've been exploring with these kinds of algorithms. That is, algorithms all of which have spiking neurons, which are coupled together uh, with weights in some particular way to perform a function. And for the most part, the way that we couple them together is inspired by what we've seen in biology and how we've built models like Spawn. So this very first one is an example of just trying to go into the real world, right? Everything I've shown you has been in simulation so far. So here we took a very simple robot, right? You, you'll notice this is Lego, right? We've got a Lego arm. Um, we do have an interesting visual system we have a special camera which actually generates spikes instead of images. Uh, it's extremely fast, which is really nice. It works much more like a real retina. It's called a neuromorphic camera. So the neuromorphic means it's kind of like a brain. And so we put these two things together, and then we uh, showed that we could get this thing to basically write, a na write its name up. And one thing that's nice about this is actually how fast it's going. So if you've seen robots write before, you've probably seen robots write. It's not that complicated. Typically, they are nowhere near this quick. They're not quite that messy either, right? But this is uh, because we have both that camera and also because processing in neurons, the way we've set it up here, actually can be much, much faster than what 
it can be in computers for various reasons I'm happy to talk about later on. So now I've shown you how we can sort of move into the real world, but we're also interested in not only applying these algorithms to understanding sort of biological kinds of systems, but you know, maybe we, if we can control a, a robot arm, we can control something even less like a biological system, so something like a quadcopter. So this, again, is going to be in simulation again. Uh, on the left-hand side, this is a bunch of the neural activity that's actually controlling how this quadcopter is flying around. And uh, what it's basically doing is it's just trying to fly to that green sphere that you'll see. Uh, this image on the very top here, that's the camera. So that's what it's seeing from its point of view. And so the first couple of demonstrations are just showing that it can sort of go very rapidly to the circle. The other thing I should mention is it doesn't know anything about gravity, so it's actually learned that there's gravity and it has to act against the gravity in a particular way. Right there we put a box on it, so it didn't know about the mass of the box, and here we're going to drop the box, and so again this changes the dynamics of the system a lot when you begin to add masses and remove masses and so on very quickly, and so it's adapting to all of these changes on the fly. So it's um, being able to you know, account for unexpected states that it's in and then have a controller which can actually still keep the system stable and fly to the targets as required. Um, and I haven't shown this part, but uh, you know, we've got all these other weird parts in the environment. These are all kinds of weird perturbations and things that you can send it into and it will very quickly adapt to different kinds of perturbations, things like wind and so on. So one of the things that becomes clear as you build these sorts of models right, is that you need to be able to run them quickly, as I mentioned. So if you want to fly a quadcopter, you need to be able to solve the control problem very quickly. If you have a really big model, you also need a lot of compute. And what's happened is people have begun to take this question very seriously at the hardware level and begin to design chips uh, and computers, which are called neuromorphic computers, just like that neuromorphic camera I talked about, where they're structured in order to work more like a brain than like a standard digital computer. And the easiest way to understand the difference is that the brain is uh, computing in parallel. So there's, you know, all these billions of neurons are active at the same time and sending messages at the same time. In your computer, instead, and actually they do it kind of slowly. In your computer, instead, you have very, very fast communication, right? So the, the uh, sort of clock speeds are very high, um, but it's bottlenecked it's at some width of a bus, like 64 bits in most modern computers now or less. And so it's a very different way of sending information around the system. And so people have been building hardware like this. So this is one of our collaborators uh, from Stanford. And they're building chips where they're actually organizing the individual transistors in order to simulate the effects of a neuron. Right? So they're taking transistors and they're building a model of a neuron by organizing those transistors in a particular way. Right? So this is no longer digital computation. In fact, it's analog computation. And that's nice too, because then you can get very, very low power computers. And if you can you know, make them massively parallel and so on, then you can begin to a, not pay a lot of power, and B, have a lot of computation. So here's a very, it's a simple uh, preliminary demonstration of this particular kind of uh, neuromorphic computer, but it basically is showing that you can compute uh, rotation. So you'll see on the far right-hand side that the neural activity, which is the wiggly one, is kind of out of phase by 90 degrees. So it's like 90 degrees behind the input, but that means it's actually computed a function from the input. And these are all the spikes that are being generated on the chip in the first population, which is just getting this input, and then in the second population, which is computing this rotation. So it's simple and preliminary and so on. But right now, we're working with that group to build the next generation of these chips, which should be able to model that, uh, to run that spawn model. So we're hoping to have that done in the next couple of years. A very different kind of neuromorphic computer is this one. This is called Spinnaker, and this one's from Manchester, uh, which is also where Professor Paul Annie is from, in case you didn't know. And uh, what's being done here is actually a lot of digital chips have been taken. So these are the chips that are in your cell phone. And uh, they put thousands and thousands of chips on one board. So each one of those black squares that you see has about 48 chips, or has about uh, 20 chips in it. And there's 48 chips on that board. So you have about 2,000 processors all working together. And each one of those processors can run about 200 neurons, 200 to 2,000, it really depends what you're doing, uh, neurons in real time. So what we can do in this case, right, so this is uh, digital, right, but it's still a very different kind of architecture than what you'd find in your laptop or your cell phone. And so because it's digital, it's a little bit easier to work with than some of the analog computation, so we've been able to do things slightly more complicated. So here we can see that there, this is that board actually stuck on a little robot. It's got two of those neuromorphic cameras right here, and it's driving itself around. You'll notice it's uh, fully autonomous. And what it's trying to do is that guy has a light in, its hand, in his hand, and it's trying to go towards the light. If the light gets too close, then it backs up. 
And if it goes one way or the other, then it tries to keep the, the light in the very center. So it's a very simple sort of computation, but it's a nice example where we've now got sort of input and output and a fully autonomous system, um, all of which is running in spiking neurons using the methods that we devised. So this kind of just gives a sense of some of the ways that we're sort of pushing forward um, in the more technological domain as opposed to looking at health applications. And in order to move both of those uh, ways of applying this research forward, we thought it's very important in order for us to teach other people how to use these methods. Right? So we've developed these methods kind of in our lab, and we've used them a lot. But in order to you know, begin to explore the brain in anything like its full complexity, you need more than just one lab working on these sorts of problems. And so what we've done for the last two years is we've invited everybody to Waterloo, everybody being like people from all over the world to Waterloo, to come and learn the sorts of methods that we're using. We give them access to these neuromorphic computers. We ask them to bring their problems and then try to get them to solve their problem over the course of two weeks, uh, or at least get a really good start on their problem. And so what I'm going to show you at the very end here is uh, an example. It's just a very quick video showing a bunch of different sorts of examples of things that people did, many of which we didn't at all expect. So we call this uh, summer school brain camp for fun, right? And basically people come, as I mentioned, from all over the world. They came from South Africa, uh, China, the UK, United States. And this is an example of people sort of, in this instance, they're doing uh, inference that is using language-like representations. Here's a different, <coughs> excuse me, a little kind of robot. That's a finger. That's a neuromorphic finger, so it actually senses touch in something like the way that uh, people and other animals do. Here you can see some of the hardware that people are getting access to. And so we, for the first couple of days, we just teach them the methods and introduce them to the software platform which we've developed in order to make this sort of large-scale modeling much simpler. And then we let them add it, right? So people get together in groups of uh, two or three, and they begin to develop models of all kinds. And so we'll begin to show, uh, see them showing up on the, uh, oh, that one disappeared too quickly. So this is that 48-chip board. This is one of those cameras. Uh, that camera was actually being used to look down at uh, ping pong tables that was trying to hit a ball as it came flying in. Um, uh, it's always nice to see people working together a lot, so you, there's a lot of collaboration involved. You see engineers and neuroscientists, uh, computer scientists and so on all show up and try to solve problems, and they bring very different skill sets together. Uh, this is a leech robot that somebody brought with them and then built a programmer uh, or a controller for. That's the finger I mentioned, and they got it to actually sense different kinds of textures and be able to classify textures. Uh, this is an experiment that was being run at Cambridge University where they're getting monkeys to perform particular kinds of decision-making tasks, and they had it running on the Spinnaker board here, and that's the model itself, which is quite complicated, but they were able to use it in order to understand what kind of neural activity to expect in the monkeys. This is the same model that was being used in Spawn to control an arm, but in 3D. This is controlling a wheel using the same sort of control algorithm, again, something very non-biological. And these last few pictures are just showing that it's not all work, right? So people do come and have fun and hang out and uh, go canoeing and all kinds of stuff. But it's always great to be really impressed and surprised by the collaborations that occur. Um, for many years since, people have been publishing projects which started up at this brain camp. And so, you know, we're very excited to be running it again this year. And with that, I'm going to stop and thank you all very much for your time and attention. Okay, so in the interest of time, we have uh, opportunity for three questions, and then maybe you can capture Chris as well at uh, the uh, refreshments time. So, questions? Yes, sir. Right. <laughs> maybe you can repeat it. Yeah, so the question was, how do we, I, I mentioned that we, you know, the important part is coming up with the connection weights between all the neurons, and the question was, well, how do you learn those weights? Um, I guess the sort of shortest answer is that we do not do learning the same way that people typically do learning in order to generate those weights. So we have developed a set of methods which don't rely on learning. So the typical thing people have done in the past when building artificial neural networks is to take a lot of neurons, connect them all together randomly, and then have a learning rule which will tune each of those weights slowly over time so you can get your network to perform a particular function. Uh, we've developed a, another method which is much more efficient, so it can solve the, this optimization problem a lot quicker, um, but it doesn't in any way attempt to um, sort of replicate the process of learning until you actually run the model. So 
when you run the model, I showed an example of, of the model learning you know, what reward or what uh, sort of writing down which digit was most rewarding. And so you can introduce learning into the model after the fact if you want. Um, you can use learning as a way of developing the model if you want. But one of the reasons we've been able to build such big complicated models where other people haven't is because we also have a non-learning method of finding those weights. So I, I mean, that's as much as I can think is useful in this <laughs> circumstance, yeah. Uh, yes, so the question was, do we use any 3D printing? Um, not until recently, but as soon as we began to go into the world, so we wanted to build robots that were actually the kinds of things that could be controlled by these controllers, we realized that most industrial robots are not the right kind of robot. So they expect you to give them a position to go to, and then they'll go to that position. This is not how your body works. Your body is force controlled, so you determine what tensions and torques to put on your muscle, or, or on your uh, joints by using your muscles. Right? And so you actually have to figure out um, exactly what kinds of forces you're applying. It also is the reason that we don't you know, crush everything when we pick it up, or that we can slow down if something gets in our way that we weren't expecting. And so these kinds of robots are generally not uh, available, so we had to turn to methods of manufacturing our own robots in order to uh, test out these kinds of controllers. And as soon as you begin to manufacture any kind of hardware like that, you have to use lots of 3D printing. OK. So I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Pogliani down to thank Dr. Chris, please. I believe that will more work. Uh, can you hear me? It's no great loss if you can't. Um, I was actually invited to introduce Chris this evening, uh, only there was a slight dysfunction in the collective brain, and I, I will now introduce him. There he is. <laughs> and actually, I can tell you what we did before we came into the lecture theater. We had a, a lovely dinner and discussed uh, my own history in Manchester, where I was befriended by Alan Turing, who perhaps uh, came into your attention through uh, Cumberbatch's film, Breaking the Code. Anyway, Alan Turing uh, told me that I should join him in doing something re reminiscent of what you've been hearing about, trying to build a bridge from mathematics to some achievement of millions of years of evolution. What Alan Turing wanted me to work on was the mathematics underlying a pine cone, why you have to go a certain number of turns before you find another pine which uh, registers with the first one. And I told him quite correctly that I wasn't clever enough and went and did something else. But what you've heard tonight is uh, an even more daring undertaking because uh, you've been watching somebody in the process of building a bridge from mathematics uh, to the supreme achievement of evolution, which is the human brain. And uh, I think last time that was undertaken was by Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein. Uh, it was a relief to see some human beings, I must say, in that film at the end. Uh, they looked awfully nice. Um, but it has been a memorable experience, and uh, I, when I heard that the uh, Spawn, or Spawn Plus, or Double Plus, uh, responded to rewards, there was no mention of how you reward a uh, computer. But uh, there could be a reward, and that, that is in 20 years' time from now, the foundation lecture will be given by Spawn with many pluses <laughs> after it, and we all look forward to that. Meanwhile. It's been a lovely evening, and thank you for it, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> Hopefully no Frankenstein.
you so much. Um, thank you again for, uh, for coming this evening. It really was, uh, it was absolutely fabulous. And I have to confess, this is the, the fifth time that we've done it. And uh, uh, this may be among the best because at least I understood uh, more than 50% of what was being discussed. I'm not a scientist. Um, I also have to say, in part because this is the last time I will be hosting uh, this event, that one of the big thrills about being here is being in the same room as uh, Dr. Pliani, and not just because many of you know he is a distinguished scientist and has won the Nobel Prize, but because he shows all of us that we can excel in the lab and also make a real difference in the world. And so uh, I'd like a round of applause for... I was a history major than a business professor, so that's part of the reason why my grasp of some of the underlying science is weak, but I, I did take a few points out of what you said. So the first point was that uh, Dr. Elias Smith's research really confirms my own, which is I am getting older, I am getting dumber, and uh, you have much to look forward to. And I'm very sad that Spawn is not going to solve my problems in the short term. Uh, the second point is, um, we don't like Henry Markham. <laughs> I made note of that. Uh, but I did think it was really interesting to hear about how the uh, research is being, um, and the, the approach is being opened up in a very different way than uh, um, perhaps was the tradition in the last century. So the, the idea of open science and bringing people together to build on each other's work in a collaborative way I think is, is fascinating and really inspiring. And I think the last thing for me is uh, the power of interdisciplinarity. I mean, your background is, is astonishing, bringing together philosophy on the one hand with neuroscience on the other. And I think too often we dichotomize science, technology, engineering, and math, and the social sciences and humanities. So for me, this was uh, really exciting, really inspiring, and a great way to, uh, to uh, frankly, end my time at Ryerson. Um, I also wanted to thank, of course, NSERC and RCIS, uh, as well as the staff in the Office of the Vice President of Research and Innovation. I hope you'll all stay to enjoy the light refreshments and perhaps delve further into the great brains in the room. Thank you very much.